All right. Hello, my name is Zach. I'm the director of communications here at PLU. And today uh, we're talking online with Jasmine Mendez, who's a graduate of our Master's in Fine Arts and Creative Writing, the Rainer Writing Workshop. How are you, Jasmine? I'm well. Thank you for inviting me. Of course, of course. And um, I'm excited to talk about um, your new play. But first, I'm just wondering if you can kind of center us in a little bit of your writing story. And I know you write across different mediums. And if you could just tell us about who you are as a writer. Yeah, so um, I've been writing for many years. I started uh, with poetry. Um, I started writing sort of my teen angsty poems in my journal when I was in middle and high school um, and never really thought I could be like an official writer or a published writer, um, mostly because I didn't really see a lot of folks with my background uh, um, as, as Latina, as Black, as Dominican, or and really any of that um, until late in life. Um, I was in high school, the first time I read anything by a Puerto Rican writer, I'm not Puerto Rican, but that felt like the closest thing to, to my lived experience at the time. And um, and it wasn't until college that I started putting my own writing out there through um, spoken word, um, open mics and slam poetry. Um, I was a performer at first. I did theater um, all through middle and high school, all through college, um, and then finally started sharing my own work uh, when I was in college through open mics. and. Um, it wasn't until I was in a memoir writing class, actually not poetry, with a professor who was putting together an anthology of um, younger uh, Latinx uh, writers who liked one of my memoir pieces um, and decided to publish it as part of this anthology. And so seeing my work, my written work in that book and seeing my name like in print in yeah. a book, I was like, oh. It was just phenomenal. It was like this mm -hmm. this otherworldly experience. Anyone who's had something published the first time just understands that, you know. Um, and so I decided then that that I wanted to continue that that the ability to to see my work in writing. I always thought I was mostly going to be a performer and that I could reach more people through spoken word and through doing my work out loud in schools and things like that, um, which I still do a lot of. Um, that there was something about the permanence of seeing my work in print, um, sort of the the lasting legacy yeah. of that, that really got me excited. And so since then, I've just been um, publishing and putting stuff out there and getting yeah. rejected. Don't don't feel like it's always just, you know, someone comes to you. They don't always come to you. Obviously, you've got to do the work and put yourself out there um, and submitting and submitting. And, and I started submitting um, back in 2000 and... Oh, I want to say 10 or 11 when a lot of it um, was still very much like you put the paper in the mm. envelope, you put a stamp on it, you send it out. It must take, it takes even longer. <laughs> it takes longer. Yeah, there was still a lot of folks that were only accepting, you know, physical copies. Um, luckily, we've evolved from that yeah. and Submittable is, is our friend. But um, but yeah, so I've been publishing since then. And um, as you mentioned, I write for both children and adults in various genres um and just keep keep doing the work and, and putting it out there so so it's interesting that you were active in theater but then kind of started as writing um poetry so in some way um kind of writing writing for the stage isn't necessarily something brand new it's something sort of new as a writer but familiar as a as an artist yeah yeah so i um i was always definitely drawn to the performance aspect of of literature and, and writing um, and the arts. Um, and it just got to a point, though, with theater, sort of traditional theater forms, where, again, I wasn't seeing my stories and my experiences presented on the stage. And so I wanted to change that. I'm like, well, if, if I'm not able to tell those stories as an actress, then I need to write those stories myself. Um, and I felt like at, at first, you know, very much poetry was the way to do that and to express um, myself and put it on the stage in that way. And then I played for a few years with doing a one woman show, um, never quite <laughs> got it together enough. I just, it felt really daunting. It still does feel very daunting to put on like my own one woman show. I know that I'm very capable of doing it. Um, it's just felt like, it hasn't felt like the right time. I, I feel like the time is coming, but it just hasn't yeah. ever felt like, you know, there's other projects that have sort of taken urgency and precedence over this this one woman show. And so, um, but yeah, I've always definitely thought about the performative aspect of literature and especially poetry have always felt like it lives and breathes more when you speak it out loud, when, when it doesn't have to be performed, but just that it's spoken, right? That you can hear the language, the rhythms, the musicality. And I'm very um, passionate about that. I'm very excited about the idea of, of putting um, poetry, you know, in front of people and, and to be heard. Um, and so, so yeah, I've, I've done, I've done a little bit at all. I just now have considered myself a playwright because I've just now written sort of my first full length play. 
Um, but the performance aspect of it has always been kind of in my blood and part of my history. So yeah, I wanted to talk about the play. It's called City Without Altar and it's premiering in Portland, right? Next month or right, right now we're speaking, it's still April. Um, yes. <laughs> and so um, I guess to start, could you share kind of maybe what maybe what, what the play is about and how it kind of, um, I imagine it's probably elements of it that are um, poetry inspired and, and pretty, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the prose is pretty, pretty awesome. Uh, so I really <laughs> like when poets make the jump into, into playwriting um, and memoir. Um, so yeah, what's, what's your play about? Yeah, that's, thank you for asking. Um, so it is um, actually part of, it, it evolved and began at my time uh, at, at Rainier Writers Workshop. Um, so it's actually a play in verse. And it does. So my poetry has never gone away. <laughs> it is a play, but it's a play in verse. Um, and it, it came from my Rainier Writing Workshop uh, thesis, which was a collection or is a collection of persona poems um, and docu poems as well. So it's looking at the 1937 uh, Haitian massacre along the Dominican uh, Haitian border in the city of Dajabon, which was an attempted state sanctioned genocide by Rafael Trujillo, who was a Dominican dictator for 30, 31 years, more or less 1930 to 1961 until his assassination on May 30th. And um, it looks at how the, the border was a transnational, bicultural, binational, bilingual space, pretty much up until this massacre. They 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 did have some tensions, but for the most part, Dominicans and Haitians along this border in this city got along just fine, right? They crossed the border, you know, to go to farm, um, to go to the to the, go to the farmers market, to go to school, to go to church. You know, Haitians were constantly coming back and forth. Um, Dominicans married Haitians, had Dominican Haitian children, lived fairly peacefully um, along this border and in this border community until Trujillo sort of started spewing his his hate and his xenophobia and his racism and his anti Haitianism. Um, and so he ordered his his military men to use um, machetes to um, attack and get rid of to clean cleanse the island um, of of these invaders, if you will, of these Haitians. And so this play looks at um, the survivors, the victims, the men, women, and children um, that that were a part of this massacre. And and it um, uh, takes on fictional personas um, of of the victims and the survivors um, and looks at their life before the massacre, during the massacre, and a little bit after the massacre. Um, there is also a, a modern voice, um, a, a young woman by the name of Maria, who is the, the granddaughter of one of the survivors or one of the victims of the massacre. And um, and they, they're in conversation, right? So the, this, this sort of grandmother ancestor and this modern day granddaughter are in conversation about the massacre. And it's it's really about this the stories and the histories that that are oppressed, that are silenced, that are forgotten, that are never told. Um, so many folks when I talk about this project are like, oh, I, I never knew about that. We don't we don't learn about this history sure. in, in history yeah. class or anything. There was a there was an attempted genocide in the Dominican Republic. Like, how do we not know this? And um, yeah, it's not something that's talked about in the United States and even less so sometimes in the Dominican Republic. It's a history that, that we don't like to talk about as a country right. and that even when I have, when I did my research, because I, I did a lot of research and tried to ask family members, even just about the Trujillo era, there's just a lot of like, oh, it happened. Why do you want to talk about that? Here, have some cafe con leche. Here, have some bread. Mm -hmm. Like here, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's there, even in my own interviews and research, there were very few people who wanted to talk about this time period in history and what they lived through. Um, my father is much more open about it, but he was only about 10 or 11 when the when the dictatorship ended. Um, he was born in 1950, 52. Um, so he was only, you know, about nine, 10 years old when the dictatorship ended. So he didn't have as much of that on him, you know, of that sort of like history yeah. and like oppression as like my grandparents who, when I brought it up, were like, oh, you know, it's fine. Why do you want to talk about that? You know, and so so it's been an interesting journey. I mean, I've, I've been on this journey of this play since about 2017. Um, it's gone through multiple iterations. Um, the one that is going to be presented in Portland at Milagro Theater in May is the latest version. I'm hoping the closest to final version. Um, but since it's the first time being staged, I'm sure it will go through some changes because, you know, on paper is different, you know, on page is different than on the stage. When yeah. when the actors get up and put it on their feet, I may realize like, oh, this isn't working or, oh, this needs to be clarified. You know, it just, it, yeah. it makes sense in my brain, but like yeah. on stage, it might be like, what is happening? Yeah. 
I think it's a cool thing to think about that a production can be a, a great production and it could be a full and authentic production, but then the 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 playwright can still tinker. I think that's yeah. I don't know a lot about that the process. I think that that's pretty cool. I've been learning. Yeah. I've I like I said, I did theater as an actor, as an a director my whole life, but as a playwright, this is my first time working as a playwright. And so this revision process, whereas poetry and memoir and you know, all of the other things are very you know, isolated yeah. solar, like you decide, you know, you have an editor that you can work with, but really you decide what the work is going to mm -hmm. be. Um, in this process, it's very collaborative. Um, and I've had to to sit with that and be okay with that, that like yeah. actors might have thoughts on what the line should be. And I'm gonna like, I can either say yes, or I can be like, no, <laughs> you know, and it's it's been an interesting experience to revise with this many people to be working on on a written piece as a very collaborative um, effort. Is it is the um, is it bilingual the, the play? It well, it's trilingual. So I've also trilingual. included, of course, of course, yeah, yeah. I've cl included some Haitian Creole in there, which has also been interesting because I don't speak personally. Mm -hmm. I don't speak um, Haitian Creole or French, and so um, I've had to have like sort of consultants, like other other yeah. folks that speak the language, help me work through that. And even in in the most recent rehearsal we had someone there i've been able to zoom in to some of the rehearsals and they had were able to bring in uh, someone who spoke uh haitian creole and um to, to help with the pronunciation with some of the actors who obviously also don't speak the language um and they were able to help me tinker some of the lines they're like well this is like more formal and not exactly the way we would say it so she's helped me kind of revise some of the lines for authenticity um because listen i'll be honest i was using google translate just yeah. to get started like just to get started yeah. you know i <laughs> I had this funny experience, um, it's not about me, but a couple of nights ago, I was watching, there's a big boxing match over the weekend, and I watched it with some, a couple of friends of mine who are um, um, Mexican, and after the fight, they were interviewing the winning boxer, and my friends were so upset about the translation of the interview. <laughs> Like that's not what he said. Like He said it like, with way more swag. Like, they were, and I was like, here, I've been taking you know, translated sports interviews, but with, you know, uh, <laughs> at face value for my whole life. And my, my like, the first time I watched with Mexican, they're furious about the translation. So <laughs> I don't know. I've had that in my head the last couple of days. About... Yeah, that happens to me too. When I, I've been watching a lot more TV in Spanish, uh, just like, you know, shows on, on different um, channels and stuff. And I'll see the, like, even just the like written translation at the bottom. And I'm like, that is not what that's. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> what they just I know. I just yeah. so trusting. How did you, um, uh, you live in the Houston area now, is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Were you, were you down there when you were, um, when you found our, our MFA up here? Um, cause it's a low residency program. So, so mm -hmm. folks who don't know, um, our MFA is a low residency program. So you work with a mentor throughout the year and then everyone in the program gathers for 10 days, um, on campus in the summertime when it's beautiful and there's no one here but you and it's a lovely experience. Um, I miss it so much. <laughs> I miss it so much. <laughs> I'm actually a first, I'm finishing up my first year in the program. And um, so I haven't had the residency in person yet. So I'm, I'm excited. Um, That's amazing. So were you down there and you found this program and decided it was a fit for you? Yeah. So my husband had just finished his MFA. He's also a poet and writer. And um, I was kind of in this transitional place in my life where I was like, I, you know, I was doing the writing thing on my own, but I was very kind of just insular and just like the only, I had, my husband was my only reader, my only critique partner, which he, he's great. But I was like, I just, I feel like what I'm writing is decent, but I don't really know if it's any good. I only have like this one person who's telling me things. Um, I think it's good, but is it good? And I sort of was tired of like just writing in my own little bubble. Um, and so once he finished his MFA um, at the University of Texas, El Paso, he did an online MFA, bilingual online MFA. And he loved it, had a wonderful experience. Um, I was like, okay, I think, you know, I was toying with the idea of going back to grad school. I have a graduate degree in, in education, um, but I wasn't teaching full time. I was working from home. I knew that I wanted to pursue some other advanced degree. I was kind of debating between MFA or PhD. And I was actually looking at some um, like culture and, um, and ethnic studies, looking at like Dominican studies and things like that. Um, but I was like, oh, I don't know if, if that's what I want. And I knew that for a lot of these programs, I would have to uproot my life and go somewhere else. And I was like, that's that's not possible. <laughs> like I'm not, I can't leave Houston. Um, I'm gonna stay here for, for a variety of reasons. And so I started also exploring the low residency MFA option and saw a few and PLU came up as one of them. Uh, the affordability of it was really um, intriguing to me. The fact that it was only in the summer, a lot of MFA programs require you to go in the spring and in the summer or in the winter and in the summer. 
And again, knowing kind of like my work constraints and like just my full life being here, I was like, I don't know if I can do both, you know, winter and summer or spring and summer. So the fact that, that it was just the the one time, the one residency a year was really attractive to me. So I applied to a few schools. Um, and before I applied to, um, to PLU, to RWW, the workshop, um, I had a long conversation with Rick uh, Barrett, the, the MFA director, which I found out later he, he didn't do with everybody. <laughs> so, so I was really like, oh, I think he really wanted me to come. And we were on the phone for almost an hour and a half just talking mm -hmm. about kind of my writing goals and what the program could offer. Um, he was very straightforward about what the program was and had at the time and how he was looking to make some changes. and. Um, was really excited about the growth of the program and the things that he was bringing in because I think he had he had also just started I think he'd only been the director for about a, a couple years at that point one or two years and so he was excited about the changes that he wanted to make um, and the fact that that your time with your mentor really is individualized you get to choose the books you know with some help from them you get to decide the reading because I was very particular I was like I don't want to go to these MFA programs that are only going to make me read the same canonical writers and make me do the same things. I want to be able to kind of make my own path because I've been writing on my own for a long time. I'd already, you know, had one book published by the time that I applied to RWW. Um, but again, I wanted to refine my skills and I wanted to build community and I wanted to to have feedback on my work. And so I was really attracted to that. And I'd never been to the Pacific Northwest. I'd never, I, I'd been to like, California was was as far west as I'd been, but I'd never been up, you know, yeah. uh, north. And so I was excited about potentially, um, you know, going to school and uh, in a different place and seeing, you know, new people. And um, and yeah, I still have the group chat. We my my cohort, five of us are still a part of the same group chat. We're constantly in communication. It's wonderful. I've built wonderful, hopefully lifelong friendships from that program. And yeah, I wouldn't change it for anything. Um, just the mentors that, that I now have and the writing community that I have. Um, I loved spending, getting out of the Texas summer heat in August yeah, to go up there. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, sometimes the smoke was really bad because of the oh, wildfires. Yeah. That was yeah. not fun for a couple, a couple, you know, a couple of days um, in, in two of the residencies. But overall, it was, it's just, you know, I had a wonderful experience. Um, and like yeah. I said, Rick was there the whole time just seeing he was always checking in on me and just making sure yeah. I was okay and, um, you know, offering his support. So, Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's my well, long hope, story of how I, I got, I how I managed that. it. That's what I wanted, the long story. And I hope that a benefit of, of putting your play up in Portland is that some of your RWW community can make it down. Yeah, I've invited them all. So we'll see who shows up. <laughs> I hope a couple do. So Cool. Well, I don't want to take up uh, any more of your morning. I really appreciate you uh, sharing a bit about your writing and, and your play and, and your experience. Well, thank you, Zach. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thanks, Jasmine. Take care.